Hello, 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 greetings, salutations, konnichiwa, and every other form of welcome across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsu Quinox. This is Horus. And welcome back, my dear scholars, to the study. I hope you're all doing well. Oh, hello there, Yulian20. Welcome. Ho, 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 indeed. Yes, it is the beginning of the season. That season of joy, that season of happiness, that season of really, really cold weather in some places. Oh, um, <laughs> yes, uh, how are all you fine scholars doing tonight? Or today, I don't make any difference between morning or evening for anyone. Doing well, Dr. Sam? Good to hear it. Glad to hear it. I'm always glad to hear others doing well. Yulian 20, terrific. Puns are not allowed here. Puns are not allowed. I detest puns. Private Maverick, doing pretty good. Oh, good. Firefly, I'm okay. A bit tired. Oh, I'm sorry, Yulian 20, but I do find puns slightly irritating. Ah, yes, I'm glad you're all doing well. And if you're not doing well, well, I hope this stream will be a little bit of a comfort to you. Mm. So, today is a very special stream. Today is the beginning of an annual event here at the study. Tonight, I will begin our annual reading of A Christmas Carol. Cool skeleton, time for the spoops. <laughs> Yes, I suppose so. I suppose so. Uh, yes, my dear scholars, we will be reading A Christmas Carol tonight, or at least beginning it. Um, For those of you who have been here for a while, I actually did A Christmas Carol as one of my early pre-debut streams. Um, Sadly, it is lost to the, the uh, mists of time, but I thought we could do it once again. Firefly, bring on the festive hauntings. Ah, oh, yes, yes. And if you know a little bit about some Christmas traditions, ghost stories are indeed a tradition. Mm. Yes. Um. So, yes, yes, yes. A little background on the book. Um, it was actually written in quite a... It was written by Charles Dickens, one of the most famous English writers in the world. Um... It was actually written in a hurry. It was written to pay off a few debts that Dickens had. So it wasn't... It wasn't written... It, it was written fairly fast. But it was became probably one of his most famous works. And one of the most arduously adapted works ever done. Um, it still gets adaptations to this day, both in film and theater. And in its time, Charles Dickens often would do live readings of the book. So we are continuing a tradition here at the study. Very nice, isn't it? Oh, well, my dear scholars, I think I better save some of my vocals for the story itself. What say you, my dear scholars? Shall we open this book? And enter the spooky, well, the spooky seasonal tale of Scrooge and three ghosts. Union 20, I am ready. <laughs> I see, I see. Um, what else is there I can say? Oh, um, A Christmas Carol, along with Dickens' other Christmas writings, basically formed what is now thought of as Christmas. Before he wrote it, there was really... Not a very... Well, Christmas was very different. Let's just say that. It wasn't... It was celebrated, but not in this manner. Some people have often gone as far as saying that Dickens... Uh, that Dickens invented the office Christmas party. Kinchon, there'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. Yep. <laughs> Sorry for the little song there. Uh, yes, indeed, that is a reference to the classic tradition of telling ghost stories, especially on Christmas Eve. I've heard tell, and I don't know if this is true or not, that the reason that um, Christmas Eve is the time for ghost stories was some 
cultures believed that Christmas Eve was a time when spirits and ghosts could walk freely among us due to the fact that the good that the uh, let's say the that a certain someone was born the day after so that uh, the day before is filled with spookiness cool skeleton got any sea shanties yes yes I can see sing, sing sea shanties I will not sing sea shanties tonight though because I have to save my voice I will save them maybe I'll do a um a nautical themed stream at some point if I can find some stories for it and I will sing some she's the, the, the sing some she can't sing some she <laughs> see shanties see shanties Christian, always have Krampus and the Yule Cat for nice scary stories. Ooh, the Yule Cat, yes. And the Yule Lads, don't forget the Yule Lads. As if you could. Now those are quite spooky. Mm. But yes, I say we... It might be a good idea for us to begin our tale for tonight. So, let us draw back the curtain. Oh, and, and some of you might be wondering why I'm not wearing my top hat this year. Um, so, I do have a top hat. Uh, unfortunately, it fell prey to um, uh, book squids. I had to sacrifice it to make a quick run out of a room which had gotten infested with them. It was a noble sacrifice. Also, Horace thinks I look like a joke with it on. Don't I do not. Alright, maybe I will try the bowler next time. Well, can you find it? Yes, of course I know where the hat room is. Alright, well, I'll try it next time. Firefly, the Yule Lads were in the Chilling Tales of Sabrina. I'm not surprised. The Yule Lads are quite famous in especially for those who don't know, um, the Yule Lads come from Iceland. And they have well, I'm not gonna describe each of them, but they come visiting one night a year during the Christmas holidays. Cool Skeleton, did he set it up so you'd lose it? I don't know. I suspect so. He's capable of most any manner of mischief. Mm. But anyway, let us begin our reading of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Preface I have endeavored in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their house pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. Their faithful friend and servant, C. D. December, 1843 Stave One, Marley's Ghost. And for those who are curious, this is divided into staves, which are the movements of a carol. So in other words, this is a Christmas carol. was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind! I don't mean to say that I know, of my own knowledge, what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat, emphatically, that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. 
Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residu residuary legal, legal tea, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral, and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm about to I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night, in an easterly wind, upon his own ramparts, than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say, St. Paul's Churchyard, for instance, literally, to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, for which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and on his eyebrows, and his wiry and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days, and didn't thought one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him, no wind that blew was bitterer than him, no falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entry, foul weather didn't know where to have him, the heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect, that often they often came down handsomely and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars employed him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind man's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, Dark Master. Roof. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, Warning all human sympathy to keep its distance was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts, and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. 
it had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices, like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a small, large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a small fire, a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with, a, with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge. Hamback. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come, then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah, again, and followed it up with, Hamback. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be? returned the uncle. When I live in such a world of fools as this, Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a, a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them? through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you. Much good has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come round apart from the veneration due to its sacred nature and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem to I one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow-passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. 
becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail, frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. <laughs> don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression, and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. <laughs> because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we? cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I'm sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial and homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. "'There's another fellow,' muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. "'My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas.' I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago, this very night. Uh, we have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting the, his credentials. It certainly was for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word, liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities, Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Uh, plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? Uh, they are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the parlor are in full vigor, then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you, had, you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful cause, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it. Oh, uh, under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, 
returned the gentleman. A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because of it is the time of all others when want is clearly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? And nothing, Scrooge replied. Oh, oh, you, you wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. Well, if they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Well then. How do I get rid of this thing? Oh, it looks like we have a... Uh, something visiting us right now. <laughs> How do I get rid of it? Oh well. Oh well. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <clears throat> Excuse me. First time for everything. Where were we? Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more fastidu fastidious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, profiting their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the clouds, with tumultuous vibrations afterwards. Oh, skipped one. In the wall. St yeah. Where'd I go? Oh. Peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible, and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds, with tumultuous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes, and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug, being left in sol solitude, its overflowing sullenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet, and colder. Piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. 
The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down to Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God bless you, my rich gentlemen, my not find you to smile. Scrooge seized the ruler with such en energy of action that the sinner fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congeal frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tactically admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I were to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used, when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his greatcoat to the, to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the lawn ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Corn Hill at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy set of suit of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses and have forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived where am I? Sorry. For nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all peculiar about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, alderman, and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years' dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw the knocker, without its undergoing any immediate process of change. Not a knocker, but... Ebony 
Screw. Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That and its livid color made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door, except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Pow, pow! and closed it with a bang. The sound resonated through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a severed peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. You may t talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, or through a bad young act of Parliament, but I mean to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadside, broadwise, with the splinter bar towards the wall and the door towards the balustrades, and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that, and room to spare. Which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel, Scrooge had a cold in his head, upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, 
old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Ah, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it, before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. They were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Balthasar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. And yet, that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the dis disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Have back, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell. A disused bell that hung in the room, and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, unexpectable dread, that as he looked, he saw this bell began to swing. Its sun swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased that they had begun together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise. Deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar, Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when without a pause it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon it coming in, the dying flame leapt up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. the same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle, it was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge observing him and looking through his waistcoat could see the two buttons on his coat behind. 
Scrooge had, had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapped he had, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice. No doubt about it. Who? Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you, then? said Scrooge, raising his voice. Your particular, for a shade. He was going to say to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it, then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of it being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I, I doubt, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I, I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt? Your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little scene affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be a undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror. For the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit... Staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the specter's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of his, its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as by the hot vapor from an oven. You, you see this toothpick? said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. Yeah, you are not looking at it said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this, and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug! 
At this the spirit raised a frightful cry, and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save him from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round his head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must, but why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me! And witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth a turn to happiness. Again the spectre raised a cry, and shook its chain and run its shadowy hands. You, you, you are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. T -t Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it, link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Oh, would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. It was full as heavy as as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on its sense. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable. But he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, Oh, Jacob, Marty, tell no more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers of other kinds to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge, whenever he became thoughtful to put his hands in his breeches' pocket. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed in a business-like manner, though with humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated. Seven years dead used Scrooge, and traveling all the time. The whole time, said the ghost. No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. 
The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked his chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, Captain Bound and Double Island, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by mortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good Christian good of which it is susceptible, it is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life opportunity misused, yet such was I. Oh, such was I. Oh, hello there, Sophia, and thank you for the subscription. Well, wonderful story. It is a wonderful story indeed. Oh, my goodness. But... You are always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. A lot of water for the scene. Densuo, you're welcome, Densuo. Welcome. Glad to have you here. It held up its chain at arm's length as if that were the cause of all its unveiling grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I, I will, said Scrooge. But don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. There is no light part of my pen penance pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you may, that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank ye. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost. By three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell, almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is, is this the, is is that the, uh, is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I. I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. 
respects the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't, couldn't I take him all at once and have it over, Jacob? hinted Scrooge. Expects the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the sharp, by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again, and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backwards from him, and every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did, when they were within two paces of each other. Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexplicably sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms. Wandering hither and thither in restless haste, and moaning as they went, every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double-locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-
Ah, here we are, here we are. Oh, let me get some water. That chapter... And doing the voice of Marley is very, very, very hard on my throat. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Uh, earlier readings, I used to actually give um, Marley a much more harsher and breathier voice, but oh, all oh, that is really hard on the throat. Mm. I felt a little lightheaded for a second there. <laughs> oh, I can't laugh. Oh, <coughs> oh my goodness. Mm. Yuli and Twenty, you do a marvelous job. Well, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. So, yes, uh, oh my goodness. Stave one, Marley's ghost. Oh. Uh, who doesn't forget Marley? Uh, Charles Dickens gives such an evocative image with Marley. The idea of him bound with chains. And yet, while he's trapped... Here's the interesting thing I just realized in this read. I didn't actually realize it before. Dickens does an interesting little paradox with Marley. Marley is chapped by the chains that he forged in life. And yet, while he's trapped, he is also incessantly been forced to travel throughout the world. So he is both trapped but also free. But in his freedom, he is also trapped because he can't interact like the other ghosts. All the other ghosts, he can't interact with the world itself. Firefly, that was enjoyable. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, I found that interesting. I didn't really think about it until tonight. Sophia Matsu, have you seen the Scrooge with Albert Finney? Sophia, why did you have to mention my absolute favorite adaptation of Christmas Carol? I love, 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 love Scrooge. I know the songs by heart. I could sing them all the time. <laughs> it is my absolute favorite version of Christmas Carol. Oh my goodness. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I better not sing it. It's probably copyrighted. I don't want to get in trouble. But I could sing that. I know the song by heart. Oh my goodness. It is a good version. Um, uh, what's his name? Alec Guinness plays uh, Marley in that one. Um, he does an interesting job. It is the best. It really is the best. I highly recommend it to others who to watch it. It's an interesting, really good... Albert Finney is so wonderful as Scrooge. And he's a marvelous actor. He plays both young and old Scrooge. And he does a marvelous, marvelous job at it. Um, oh my goodness, I could praise that movie forever. It is my favorite. Um, I make it, that's my other tradition for this holiday season. And uh, Horace knows this. In fact, Horace does it, actually does it with me. The very first movie, very first movie I watch for this holiday season is um, Scrooge with Albert Finney. It's my very first film to watch. Um, Horace has seen it a couple times with me. Uh, his favorite... What's your favorite song again? Oh, that's nice. Um, he likes happiness. Sophia, my grandfather and I watched it every Christmas together and sang it. Aw, oh, wonderful. Horace likes the song Happiness. I like, um, I like Life. I Like Life is a wonderful, fun song to sing. Oh my goodness, I could sing. Maybe sometime I'll have to sing that stuff. Eh. I'd have to save it for a non, for a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh my goodness, I'm worn out. We're sticking. Yulian twenty. Life likes me. I I better not say it. I don't want to get in trouble. I like I said, I could say it. Um, Marley is portrayed very differently in several adaptations. Sophia, I bully Crusader, and we will be watching it in the next suit. Oh, I will be there. I will be there. I will be there. I'm going to sing along to that thing. <laughs> I will be there. Um, Marley's depicted several different ways in in the um, Christmas Carol. Um, like I mentioned, Alec Guinness. Alec Guinness is... Marley's interesting. He gives him a kind of a sardonic sense of humor. Really, um... He also did this interesting thing where he gives Marley this really floaty way of walking. So he comes across as very erythral. Ethereal. Ethereal, that's the word. Ethereal. So he, he does this very airy walk. Um, I'm trying to remember who else played. Uh, the Reginald Owen one was... Um, 
was Leo Carroll. Leo Carroll, I believe. Yes, Leo Carroll played it on the Reginald Owen one, 1938. 1938. 1938. Um, for that adaptation, they actually add an extra scene in um, the Marley incident where Scrooge actually goes to the watch and calls them on Marley to come to the room and arrest him. But by the time they come up, Marley's gone, and uh, the watch basically has a good laugh and accuses Scrooge of drinking. And, um, yeah, that, and he shows up again. It is not a thing, so that. Maverick, I've always enjoyed both Mickey's Christmas Carol and A Muppet Christmas Carol. Excellent choices. Julian 20, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. Very excellent choices. Wonderful choices all around. There's so many different adaptations of Christmas Carol, it's almost impossible to list. Um, one interesting take on Marley was 1936's version, which was um, Seymour Hicks. Not playing Marley, but Seymour Hicks. They do an interesting thing with Marley in that. Marley showed, you see Marley's face appear on the knocker. No trouble with that. But when Marley shows up, He's invisible. You don't see him on the screen. You hear his voice, but you don't see him on the screen. And he actually directly says to Scrooge, Look well upon me, Scrooge, for only you can see me. And it's a very interesting direction to put it. Um, some people have thought that maybe it was to cheap out of the special effects, but... You know, the, the special effects to do that sort of ghostly work is not that difficult. Not at the time. It had been used in the silent film era. It was pretty basic. Um, so it was more an artistic sense. And then, there is a silent film version, which you can find. It is in the public domain. It's one of the first versions of Christmas Carol done on film where Marley is literally the only ghost in the entire story. They um, they cut out all the other ghosts and simply have Marley be the one to show Scrooge past, present, and future. Oh, and they put Marley in a sheet rather than in chains. So it it's, it's an interesting choice, I will admit. Um, well, technically... It ex the sad sound of room exists, except it's missing the last minute or so of the film. The film's like how long? It's like ten minutes? No, it's barely barely five minutes. So the last minute or so of the film is missing. So the film ends right at Scrooge's yet to come at the end of the yet to come thing. So you never see him get redeemed. It just ends there. Um, and of course, Marley has been done on stage in stage adaptations, and um, they've done it in various different ways. Usually, they have Marley come out of the floor of the stage in theaters, because that is the easiest way to get that ghostly feel rather than through the door which is very a thing that's very hard to um, to pull off on the stage, or at least it's very awkward. Um, yes, uh, let me see. Uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, I should mention that. Uh, Muppet Christmas Carol also does an interesting version with Marley, and does a little nice little tongue-in-cheek joke, by having them have two Marleys, which is, um, which are played by, and you're going to have to correct me on the names, because I'm terrible with Muppet names, Stanford and, what's, Sophia, how do you feel about the Patrick Stewart version? It's very good, it's very good, um, Sir Patrick Stewart makes a wonderful Scrooge, he's, he's a very, well, he, Sir Patrick Stewart had played done um, Scrooge as a one-man show on stage beforehand. Um, 
and he had done an audio version as well. The movie version, he does a good job. He does a very, very good job. Um, I can't remember who plays Marley in that one, but Marley's very good. It, it's an excellent version. They throw a lot more emotional scenes in it. There's a and Patrick Stewart throws a lot more emotion into Scrooge in certain scenes, especially during um during past, where there is one scene where he really, really, really throws goes all out with the emotions. Um, Private Maverick Statler and Waldorf. Yeah, that's the name. That's the name, yeah. Thank you. Um, I do like the Patrick Stewart version. It's a very, very good one. Julian 20, I call it the Picard Christmas Carol. <laughs> oh, yes, make it so. Um, let me see. So what I'm going to do, by the way, I want to say this ahead of time. I'm going to be having these little discussions when I have time, if I have time, after each chapter of um, Christmas Carol, so we can talk about, like, um, like you know, the differences and what how it holds up to different versions. So that's why I'm talking about Marley for the most part. Um, in Muppet Christmas Carol, they split Marley into two characters. Uh, Stadler and Waldorf play them, and they are Jacob and Robert Marley. Now, Jacob Marley, of course, is the original name. I'm sure some of you can get the joke with the name Robert Marley there. It's a very... It's very clever. Yeah, I, I agree, that one's a very clever joke. Uh, Yulian 20 got it. <laughs> yeah. Firefly. Bernard Lloyd played Marley and Stewart's. Oh, cool. That's cool. I, I'm not sure if I've ever seen him in anything else. Um, Horace, remember... Remind me to look up some of his other film credits, will you, when we're done here, okay? Um, there was... Another thing that, they, that often gets cut out, believe it or not, in some of the, uh... Some of the adaptations, especially the Marley parts, is the, um, sight of the other ghosts. The phantoms being sighted by Scrooge. Um, Patrick Stewart version keeps it. Um... Muppet cuts it out, I believe. Albert Finney's version keeps it in. Ironically, they don't show it. I, I don't think they... Cool Skeleton, I'm going to get going now. Bye. Okay, well, well, thank you for coming, Cool Skeleton. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, the Albert Finney version actually has a sort of a song in the scene with the spirits. See the phantoms all around around you. Do the kind you despair. I again I it's too easy for me to fall into the scene for that. Um they Yeah, they cut it out. No, they did cut it out. Sorry, lost my train of thought. Um no, that scene is in there and it's it's in the middle of the Marley scene rather than at the end. Oh, here's a little fun fact. Um Scrooge, the 1970 musical version, actually had a song for Marley, whose name escapes me now, which got cut out of the movie. It was filmed, but it was cut out. But they left in the lead-up to the song. Which is interesting. In the, uh, on the staged version of the 1970 version, they brought, put the song back in. Um, the... Yeah, the ghosts are cut out. Of, the ghosts are cut out of the 1935 version. They're cut out of the 1938 version, for 1938 because they were trying to soften the story quite a bit. Um, the George C. Scott version, which I for, we haven't mentioned that one at all. That one kind of keeps it in, kind of doesn't. Because Scrooge hears the ghosts. But when he goes to look, there's no one there. So it kind of... They kind of saved the budget on that one. 
Um, now I'm thinking, thinking what other versions are. Union 20. How about the Disney version? The Disney version keeps in the Phantoms. The Jim Carrey version does keep in the Phantoms. Although, one thing I like with the Patrick Stewart version, with the, um, the, the ghost things, they show them kind of drifting off like smoke. Like they're sort of wrapped around the chimneys and all that. That was a really neat idea, I thought. Um, and Alistair Sims. Oh, I forgot Alistair Sims, didn't I? Alistair Sim version, which is a wonderful version. I highly recommend that one as well. It's a very good movie. Um, that version also keeps in the Phantoms. It's a very... They, I can't remember if they changed anything in the Marley thing. I don't think they changed anything in the Marley thing. They changed some later things, which I will get to once we get to those chapters. But they don't change the, um, they don't change much in that scene. Oh, and of course, there's the Oscar-winning uh, short film version, which was, I think that's 15 minutes. Firefly, I haven't seen Carrie's. It's okay. It's okay. It's pretty good. It's okay. There are times when they kind of made it a little too intense, and they chose some directions which are kind of like, eh, okay, it's, it makes sense, but it's a little bit odd. But otherwise, it's a, it's a good version. It's a good version. Um, Union 20, the effects are great, though. Uh, yes, yes, they're very good. They're um, motion capture, I believe. Yes, it's motion capture, all of it. I'm trying to remember which... Where was I talking? Oh, the Oscar version. The Oscar version keeps in the Phantom Things scenes, too, but that one is very, very, very short. It... Uh, it's about 15 minutes, I think. A little less. It's a very good animated version. Um, won an Oscar, which managed to upset quite a few people, actually. But it's it's one that's worth looking at. Um, it tries to adapt the illustration styles from the original book. So it has an interesting look to it. And also, it brings back the actors who played Scrooge and Marley in the Alistair Sims version. So Alistair Sims is playing Scrooge, and Firefly Wikipedia has an entire page for adaptations of Christmas Carol. Yes, <laughs> yes. And of course, there was there are some Christmas Carols which I will not put on the list because they are. Eh. There's one in particular recently which I will not be talking about because yeah yeah it's uh yeah mm. what'd you call it Horace oh irredeemable trash fire yeah yeah the um yeah there was uh yeah it was not a good one it's not a good one and they make Marley in that one kind of um, there have been interesting, there have been actually a few uh, adaptations, I think, plays and books, which actually go out of their way to try and explain how Marley got this um, favor for Scrooge. I haven't read any of them, but I think that's an angle that, that's a pretty interesting angle to be exploring. Oh my goodness! I can feel my <laughs> oh, oh the chap. This chapter really wore me out. Mm. Let's see. Ah. Oh, sorry about that. Mm. So I think we are going to close now for the for now. <laughs> you can tell I'm kind of uh, I'm a little bit worn out. Uh, what is your um? What do you, what, what what say, horse? Well, yes, I'll do that. I'll, I will. I'll get to the books afterwards. Okay, I got 
got my scholars here. All right, so, um, so I think we be best that we close out for the for now. Um, let us see. Uh, well, sorry, I'm just I am all over the place mentally. All right, so I say unto you, my dear scholar. Oh, I forgot to say. Oh, 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 my goodness, my goodness, oh my goodness. Before we go, I forgot to tell you, all you dear scholars, my schedule's coming up. Oh, Horace, why didn't you mention that I was going to go, uh, that I was going to forget that in front of the scholars? Completely embarrassed. So, next, so this Sunday, we are going to have an extra special, hopefully, VTuber prom chaperone stream. Yay! I'm going to have um, an extra special thing up there for everyone um hope you can all come i'm really looking forward to it uh and then next week will be tuesday if everything goes according to plan more return to monkey island uh we've been having a lot of fun with that game and then next thursday again if everything goes according to plan we will continue with chapter two of A Christmas Carol. And you can all hear me destroy my voice trying to do all these immensely varied characters. Chapter 2 is, I think, the second longest chapter after the third one. And it's certainly one of the more... Well, no... It's not the sec. The third one's more descriptive. Oh, Kintron, but voices are always so much fun. I know they're always so much fun. I have such a blast doing the voices, but oh, they really do wear out, wear me out. Oh my goodness, it's a lot of energy to do them. Oh, oh. So now I I think after this I will get some. I'll be having some tea. I'll be resting a little bit, and then I will get to those books, Horace, like you suggested. But, my dear scholars, I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, till we meet again at the study. Take care, farewell, and I will see you once again. Bye-bye. What was that, Horace?